good. So we're very fortunate to uh, get a little more in depth with what we were talking about last week. Very blessed to have Marlon Lovichet here. Um, yes, you know, last week you're here, and um, someone else from your neighborhood, I believe, who gives your story, her story. Oh, um, Laura Jane. Laura Jane. Laura that's Jane. Right. Mellencamp Murphy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you known for a while? I have. Um, probably about eight years now. She's been just, she's been, it began as she was my yoga teacher and it's become more and more as uh, now I work for her and I teach in her studio. I'm really honored to do that. And um, I keep learning and learning and learning. How many of you have been in a crisis of faith? You know, this is really what I've been through. And it was so good for me to thank you for having me here because I don't have like an amazing story. But I just, it, it's been so good for me to reflect on how God has worked in my life and how he has changed things and how one thing led to another, led to another. And I just encourage you all to do the same thing, just to, I mean, I had to write things down and um, just reflect on how God has come into my life and and changed the direction from when I started. And um, I don't know if anybody here started in a more conservative background. Anybody start? Conservative, yep, Betty, and uh, start conser I started as a Baptist, and I grew up, God loves you, God loves everybody, and the world was very big, and I'm really grateful for that, we learned all of the verses about, um, you know, don't just love people with, you know, words, but love them with actions and truth. And my Sunday school teachers were so good and loving. And when I was little, that's all I learned about church. And it was only when I got a little bit older and I went to um, college. And then I went to a more bad, uh, Southern Baptist church. Maybe I shouldn't say names, but I went to a more conservative church. And I realized my world is not as big as I thought it was. I thought God loved everybody. And I realized, oh, God does not really include Catholics. Oh. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was interesting. And then it seems like as I went to more and more conferences, I realized, wait a minute, those Eastern religions, those are from the devil. And so I learned that the world is even smaller. And then there became a lot more rules and um, a lot of anger about you know, keeping people out, keeping people in, you know, making sure that everybody follows the rules. And I was like, I, I didn't want to leave my tribe, but I, um, I felt really uncomfortable. And, but I stayed with my tribe because that's all I knew. That's what my family believed in. And, um, so I just felt a little bit suspicious and, um, and I did, you know, shameful things. I'm sure like I, I stayed with my friends who were gay I love my friends who are gay, and um, I listen to shockingly alternative music, mm -hmm. things like that. But I just I still mm -hmm. stayed with my tribe because that's all you know. That's all I knew. But I, I just I just felt uncomfortable. And um, around 2000, I met Alan, and um, we kind of went round and round. But I learned that there were churches, Christian churches. That included everybody. And I started to attend um, here as one of the churches. And I learned about, you know, maybe the circle isn't quite as small as I was learning. And um, and I was really thankful and glad for that. And um, even though Alan and I, we, he, we talked a lot, argued a lot. and um, But I really, he was just kind and loving and really helped me to see that, you know, this is really God's love works. And um, I, I agree. I thankfully saw that. And I it was scary to leave the more evangelical um, conservative churches, but I did move to um, um, the um, UCC church more because I realized it fit what I believe, what I had learned in the first place, that God loves everyone. And um, no matter where we are or you know where we are on our journey or who we are, so about in 2002, after we had gotten married, I started, um, when we lived in um, Rogers Park, I started practicing yoga up in Evanston. And I thought, hey, this is great exercise because I really, I hate running. 
And um, <laughs> I really don't like exercise and it was fun. And so I enjoyed it simply as exercise. I just went and um, practiced at the gym and thought, this is great. And then I started noticing, you know, I'm sleeping better. This is really interesting. But I just, I ignored all of the um, other things that the yoga teacher talked about. I just went for only the movement. And, um, but I did start noticing some things that were, were good. I wasn't hurting myself. You know, I, um, there was no pain necessarily, but it just, I just felt better as a whole. And so I stayed with that until, um, and in 2007, when we were, he was, um, a senior pastor in Moline, we lived in Davenport, Iowa. I found a teacher, a yoga teacher there, and she taught in an Episcopal church. And I thought, well, that's kind of funny because it seemed like, you know, yoga might be a little here wrong in the Eastern world, and I probably shouldn't be there anyway, but, um, well, I'll go. And it was beautiful. I realized that um, she taught in a way that seemed worshipful. And I got to thinking, you know what? Maybe yoga can be, um, maybe it can be worshipful. I mean, for instance, you've heard of sun salutations, you know, it's just simply when you raise your arms. And I realized that when she did this, it's kind of like, Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I realized it did work in a church. And I really enjoyed that. And I kept thinking about how our movements can be worshipful. Even this, I mean, when I was a little girl, we always prayed like this. And um, yoga brings this, we call it a mudra, back. And I'm like, I mean, just try it. Just try bringing your hands together and pressing your thumbs toward your heart. And notice how that feels. Just simply notice how it feels. Really take the thumbs and press them toward your heart so you're connected with your body. So in our bodies, how it, do you understand how it changes how you feel? Or when you have your hands facing up? Or when you have your hands facing down? And even taking your feet and pressing them both. My dad was an electrician. And so he used to talk about the electrical current. And just simply bringing both feet on the ground, how that can change how you feel because you know, we are electrically charged, and this grounds us. So I just wanted you to notice these things and um, just observe. And I realized that yoga uses these things that um, with our bodies to help our minds quiet down. And another thing I did notice was the, the breathing exercises, which I um, thought were silly. <laughs> they also seem to make me calmer. And um, I just you know, observed it. I really just didn't trust everything, but I kept coming back to, you know, it makes me calmer. And at that time I had, um, we had uh, Luke um, was our surprise child. And um, we had Kira who was about two and a half, three at the time. So I could use calm. <laughs> it was a really good thing. So I'm thankful that um, the yoga and the breathing really helped calm me. And um, and I so I kept practicing, and again I'm kind of staying away from the the philosophy. I just stayed with what we do in class. And um, when I, by the time we moved to the Quad City, or um, excuse me, Wheaton, I decided that you know this is good for everybody, no matter how old you are, um, because everybody can breathe. A lot of it is just breathing. And so I um, was I was a flight attendant at the time, and I. Went to work one day, and I had this woman on my flight. Her name was Kathy, and and she said she teaches yoga in her church. And I'm like, really? And it was in Glen Ellen. I'm like, oh, that's right down the road from me. So she was able to um, tell me where she learned and um, how she got it started. And it gave me a lot of um, excitement about bringing yoga. Just everybody here could be in my class. I wanted to include people that would never go to a gym and would never go to a yoga studio. I wanted to 
to share this, just the movements and the breathing with everybody. So I did um, go to a year of school. And again, I just tried to learn the basics without learning the philosophies. But unfortunately, my teacher, Karen, taught a lot about the sutras that Lord Jane talked about last week. And um, I started realizing that the sutras really made sense. Things like, um, I wrote down one that I thought was, be happy for the happy, compassionate for those with troubles, and notice, but don't react when somebody does something wrong, but just observe. And I realized, you know, that's kind of biblical. It's, it's maybe, maybe aligned with the Bible. And then she taught a lot about legends. And um, I thought, well, this is interesting. She taught about one named Manu. And he was um, uh, one of the original gods or whatever. But it's, it's a story. And he saw a little fish that was it had flipped out of the water, maybe on the sand. And so he saved a little fish. And um, he kind of liked it. So he brought it home and he put it in a little in a little cup of water so the fish could live. And then the, the fish got bigger, so he had to get a bowl. And then the fish got bigger and bigger until no longer, I don't know if you've ever done this, you have a fish that you can't take care of anymore. So he took it to the ocean and he let it go. And there the fish, of course, got bigger and stronger. And then one day um, there was, he was told that there was going to be a flood. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. So he builds an ark. And he gets into the ark, and um, the ark and the flood comes, and the ark goes out to sea, and there he is. And then he sees this fish that has grown giant, and it tows him back to land. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Manu is saved by the fish. And I thought, isn't that interesting that the legends would kind of line up with Noah, who, you know, he, he was looking to God. He was paying attention. He was a good man. And God did save him. So I started thinking, wow, there's a lot of things that are, even though these are, you know, way, way, way many miles apart and different parts of the world, but similar stories. And I started being more open. And I don't know if you've ever gone through this, but it was really hard for me to go through the Bible is truth. And you always go to the Bible to be open to other religions. Have you guys ever done this? You know, I felt like I was cheating, but I, I realized <laughs> that um, it's okay and maybe I can be open to um, Eastern religions or other thoughts. And I felt like my heart was growing more open and more open. And eventually I did start my class and um, it's still continuing every Thursday, and I'm really grateful for that with just a few people in my church. And um, I incorporate scripture and praise. I bring it into my practice, and I try to make it, you know, just right for everybody. So um, one thing I also learned about the breath is that, and you may know this already, but the word for breath is in, I think it's in Aramaic or Hebrew and Greek. Numa, I think is the Greek word, is spirit. So the way that, it's amazing. It's not even, if they're not like each other. They're actually the same word. So the word for breath and spirit. And so when we breathe in, we can think about breathing in God's love. And when we breathe out, we can think about being thankful. So we can use our breath to bring in God's presence. It was really mind-opening for me and spiritually opening. And Laura Jane, as you heard last week, she talks a lot about not living from up here, which is what I learned growing up in the Midwest. You work hard. And you only read, I didn't bring my Bible. I uh, can't believe I did that. Um, you only read your Bible. And um, that's where your truth comes from. And she said, we need to live from our heart. And I thought, whoa, what is she talking about? And it took me um, a couple of years, maybe more, to come to what um, she meant by that. 
and what I, it means to me. And I started, it helped by having um, 2020. That's when um, I no longer worked for the airlines and I had a lot of time on my hands. And I started thinking about, um, you know, what the Bible does say about heart. I'm going to find my notes here. And I started noticing things in the Bible that, that said things like, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know. And that's from Ephesians. And I thought, huh, maybe the Bible does talk about our heart and leaving our intellectual mind and coming into. And um, other verses that I saw were, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And my favorite one was when I read the story of Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And you all know this story when there's two men and they're in Emmaus, the town of Emmaus, and then they see Christ, who has just been crucified and has risen again. And, and they ask him what he's doing, and they get to talking to him. And, and then and he says, you know, what are you talking about? And he says, well, are you the only one that doesn't know the story? And so they tell him about this man who had been crucified and risen again. And everybody is like all a Twitter. They're all like, how could you have not heard this? And so they're like, why don't you join us for dinner? And so he joins them and um, they keep talking to him and he's right there with them. And then when they go to eat, he breaks bread. They're like, oh. they realize who it is. And it says their eyes were opened. And they say, weren't our hearts ablaze within us when he was talking and explaining the scriptures? So I, I just thought, is that amazing that they didn't hear with their minds, their intellect didn't let them know, but they really did know. And it wasn't until later that their hearts were ablaze. So did you want to, do you have anything to, that you would like to add about that or share about that? Any time when you knew that your mind was not telling you something, or you can just think about it, that your heart knew that this is right. What you mentioned, <clears throat> what you mentioned growing up, the uh, very rigid, but, but nonetheless knowing love was involved. Um, my background is, is a Lutheran, mm -hmm. and I think I was fortunate in that a young man in the 30s came to our church uh, right out of seminary, and the church was almost ready to close its doors from an extended pastorate in which he read the sermons. And there was really a sense of, oh dear, what's going to happen in the church? In five years, this particular pastor had built the church up to about 350 members with a Sunday school even bigger and a four-week vacation wow. church school. He went on to become executive secretary of the Lutheran World Federation. We were the only church he went. He went from us to be pastor of the, of the Lutheran students at University of Minnesota, and then on to, there we are. You can imagine with that worldwide perspective, that obviously this person had, had been raised in Lindsburg, Kansas. Where did he get it? Who knows? But this particular person taught, and I, he was one of my confirmation pastors, in such a way that I never did get boxed in. And I am very grateful to this because in that period, and we did not talk about things being Swedish. We didn't talk at home anyway. Um, <laughs> that means so conversation cool. like, you talk too much if I talk too much. <laughs> if I ask a question, that was an unnecessary question, as one Swede said. That was a joke in Sweden. Don't laugh. <laughs> Anyhow, to sum it up, what I was opened up to in the training of these formative teenage years, in that style of teaching, 
let me open to all aspects, not just Christian, but others too, in which there's logic and sense in any religious form or philosophical form, is a better term, that we find. And it's always been interesting to me to find out where at the roots of these things, however messed up practitioners can make it, there's a core of truth that rings a bell throughout. And I think that's where God functions. Does that make sense? I As love that, Lois Eve. Thank you. Yes. I think so, too. And that's what yoga has helped me see. And every Saturday morning, we have yoga at Covenant Living on the in-house TV for our physical education person for 20 minutes. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for sharing. So many that. of us do yoga out there. I'm not surprised. I'm so mm -hmm. proud of you. I mean, I think that, like Laura Jane probably said, science is finally catching up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yoga's been around for more than five, 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody really knows. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm so glad. And absolutely, it is the worldview. It's that God mm -hmm. really does. It's kind of, it goes back to what I originally learned that God is in all of us. I learned that early on, and I don't know how the church is present. Yes. I mean, he has created all of the things, you know, these beautiful trees in Wanaka, all of this beautiful the lake. And so, of course, we feel closer to God in his nature. And when you see it, when you see God in the worldview, how he's been working around the world and not just in this little bubble, it makes God bigger and more accessible to everybody. And yeah. um, as a sidebar, I remember because I was so, oh my gosh, jaw dropping to hear a person this back in the 60s um, when I was subbing at a situation in which I met someone who was also a Lutheran. Um, and she was puzzled because I was of a different denomination and she didn't feel that was quite Christian and not her <laughs> denomination. I, exactly, the world's <laughs> world. So <laughs> so <laughs> different. And yet the denomination and the world off from Augustana, heaven forbid. Right. That it's crazy that we can ever so yes. it stuck in my mind because I'm <laughs> I have nothing to say. <laughs> right. It's what it's, did you say? I we I just always think oh, those aren't from God. Yeah, I don't she, know where we she, get those she ideas. She pitied me. <laughs> and I wasn't belonging to the Missouri or evangelical uh little Norwegian bench or whatever in our Yeah. The point it, was that she was in this little box. Right, right. And that's I don't know what to do with Presbyterians. I didn't do that. <laughs> I think um out of the compassion of our hearts is how we come, or at least for me, to the knowledge of God. And when you know you get on the road, on the head road, you come to a roadblock. But then, out of the compassion of your heart, you come to knowledge. The deeper knowledge. Thank you. And and I, I don't know why it took me so long to learn that. I it, still it, it, it. it. It's a lifetime. It is a lifetime. I love that. Thank you. Jane, you ready to Yeah, Marla, in your teaching, um, you've talked about opening up um and I that really resonates with me. When you see somebody who could use a little opening up, do you have any particular things to say or do or get them to think about or ways to, any tools to help open? Oh, good question. Um, I think yoga itself is a tool and it may not be the asanas, the movement. Um, my um, 
my original teacher, Karen, and Laura Jane is actually her teacher. So mm -hmm. um, she would teach things that I thought, oh, I definitely would never do that. Um, like the ohms. Um, and I thought, oh, I could never do that because that doesn't sound very Christian at all. And, <laughs> and uh, when I said, exactly. And, um, and, but she would teach about the vibration because we're all vibration. And, um, and I kept thinking, you know, I could never participate in that, you know, but um, we would practice that and I would just kind of, kind of come in like this. And then one time I talked to her about it and I said, you know, I just, I can't quite do this with my Christian faith. And she said, well, don't, don't do that. Then just say, Amen. And I'm like, oh, it's the same thing. It's the same vibration. And when we have vibration, it, it changed, like we'll just we'll just try humming. Okay. Let's just take an inhale. We're gonna hum. Mm -hmm. And just notice. And if you love to sing, you know how singing changes your heart. Mm -hmm. It's it's vibration, and when you sing together, wow! And all through the Bible and scriptures, it talks about singing and praising, and um, they talk about the heart. These are all vibrational. The flute or the lyre, whatever it is that David plays, it's vibrational. My son plays the euphonium, and he's always talking about how the vibration makes his lips hurt. It's all vibration, and so I guess that's a tool that has helped me just. Noticing that um, I am, I'm connected with God. I'm connected with you. I mean, just who you are makes me react and be, we're together. It's the people who are here online. It all brings energy to who you are. And it's just realizing that. And I think the connection of um, chanting together is helpful or just the movements. And I love, um, in yoga, it's called a Sangha. I go to Lord Jane's studio and it's called Yoga Among Friends. I don't know if you picked on that, picked up on that, but it's not for exercise, but um, we do yoga together. We do the movements. And um, it's also, it's been a community, especially through um, 2020 and the, you know, we showed up in masks and things like that, or, you know, when we were finally able to meet together and we became more of a community. And of course we have that in our churches as well, mm -hmm. but it's also meant to be, to build you up as a community. So yoga is, um, it's very powerful in many ways. And I guess I keep thinking of yoga as filling in the cracks. Like I've read for my whole life, do not be anxious, do not worry. Well, <laughs> I'm an anxious person, and um, I grew up in a very anxious world. My dad was a farmer also, and so we we never knew. Was it going to be hail that destroyed the crops? Well, we can't buy anything because we don't really know. What's the price of corn? What's the price of beans? We have no control, so hang on to everything and rip and worry and anxious. I grew up in that as well. So when I heard the words, you know, I would read the words like, do not be anxious and like, well, how do you do that? Well, I feel like yoga has helped me with the breathing, especially the breathing. We spend a lot of times with breath work. And I bet you do in your yoga class, Lossi, just, just the breathing, the deep breathing. She emphasizes breathing. Yes. And shortly thereafter, again, I'm in house to you, follows chair chi for half an hour. Excellent. And so there's 50 minutes Saturday morning of working with your body in a way that is from the stern, gets you in a balanced situation. Wow. It's very, very, very helpful. And how old are you? How you, old am I? Yeah. Uh, 96. Okay. If somebody... <laughs> <laughs> going on 97. Thank you. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. We're a long-lived family. I, I try to tell people it doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, Lord James, 
you know, older than I am, and she's a wonderful teacher. But it doesn't matter how old you are. If you are in a hospital bed, if you can breathe, you can do yoga. Mm -hmm. If you can breathe, and that's um, <clears throat> just what I've learned, that everybody really can do yoga. And it, it does help with um, your body. It helps your physical um, body. And there's a saying, um, the issues are in the tissues. And as, <laughs> and as we all know, when that's that worry, you know, it, it goes into our stomach, it goes into our nervous system, and um, the whole world is nervous and anxious. And um, yoga is a tool, the movements, the breathing, so many things is all about helping us to ground and, and rest. What else? I think that's all I had. I just, I wanted to know about how you felt about any, any questions, not that I could answer for Laura Jane, but anything that Laura Jane brought up that you were kind of wondering about or thinking about. It was a lot. It was a lot. What is he, what is, you said chair, chi. I beg your pardon? Chair, chi. Is that some yoga you can do just in your chair? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. You never get out of where you're sitting. Okay. And for, those of covenant living or any place else who and lying down is something I do getting up is what I do. <laughs> and yeah. for everybody over a certain age. And uh, since I have uh since it was overused repairing two houses, sanding ceiling you know, over here. Um, I have a rotator cup problem here. And then I got hit with a snow shovel here and have a Popeye. So these two arms are strained, though they're plenty strong. But nonetheless, getting up off the floor, which many people do for exercise, something I don't do. That's where the chair chief has been so helpful. And pre COVID, and of course, anywhere you live as an institution, like we do. You don't go to any meetings at all. But before that, we had between 50 and 60 of the group of um, 250 living there being in a room doing chair chi every Saturday morning. And we continue on screen. It doesn't meet in the room anymore. Mm -hmm. And chair, um, um, COVID changed living patterns. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Change living kind of, I think, permanently for a lot of people. They stay in the room a lot more because it's convenient. Right. But at least we have an in house TV, Chair mm -hmm. Chi, and um, I'm sure a good half of the group are there doing it, and the yoga also. Mm -hmm. And it does make a difference. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, just sitting up tall, just, I mean, try the difference mm -hmm. between this is what we're usually doing. And I want you to all just try to kind of lean over with your head forward and breathe. Just kind of like you're looking at a phone or a computer. Breathe. See how that feels. And now bring your, your spine upright. And now try to breathe. Relax your shoulders. And just see the difference. There is just a remarkable difference. And I see that you're sitting up really nice and tall. Well, could I add, please, since um, Covenant Living, wherever you go, you have to walk a great distance. It's like the tentacles toward the town center. So dinner, you name it. Um, I'm the short one, and I go a third of a mile That's each way. That's great. And others further, the nuts, hickory, walnut, those guys, they have further. I'm one of the closest ones, below. And as I walk, and I've done this regularly, I think of what we learned um, working in, um, I'm a retired voice teacher, in our conferences, we always start out in these conferences with someone who works with physical breathing and posture, which is basic to singing. And I, as I walk, 
I think myself up and out of the hips, up and out of the shoulder, and I think of that line between your heels and the top of your head, which goes through your spine. And being of a minimal height, I'm a yeah. very tall family, not medium, tall. Six foot six is the tallest one. And to be in this short situation, <laughs> never fight made five two, to be in a group like this, I've always thought upright. <laughs> one does by sheer survival. <laughs> in the group picture, it looks like I'm standing in the hole. But what it has made me do is think of posture and tuck in the fanny, mm -hmm. easy shoulders, let your arms dangle, and uh, if nothing else, think of a hook at the top of your head going that way. And as I walk in the swinging mm -hmm. stride, this is therapy itself. It is. And uh, I adjure everybody to think of, of <laughs> not painfully, but you know, the sense of stretching up and out of each part of your body, mm -hmm. and it does well, automatically. You're breathing better, and uh, but it, it's a it's a good aspect to carry with you in the walking to the grocery or whatever. Absolutely, and that's you know I went to um oh and I have a scoliosis family inheritance also, mm -hmm. and that doesn't help. Uh, today I'm in pain because it's funny. Right. But yoga is the best thing you could be doing for it. You do what you can. You do what you can yeah, and I you continue to, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I learned that when you walk a long distance and you really get tired, if you lead, like you were saying, upright and you lead with your heart, think about your heart being lifted, um, your legs get lighter. I don't. Even, I don't exactly understand how it works, mm -hmm. but and try it sometimes. Yeah, it and use your arms. Yeah, it does. It isn't static. Exactly. So, what what do you think is the optimum number of yoga exercise period a week? Is, is it's like once a week, twice <laughs> well, a week. Well, I don't even like to call Every it exercise day. because. Well, okay. I, I, yoga. <laughs> it's it's for me. It's an everyday practice. And it might just be 20 minutes a day, but it, and it might just simply be breathing or my yoga, my, the meditation. All yoga is meant to lead to meditation. All of the movements are only meant so we can quiet our mind and um, quiet our bodies because, I mean, I have a lot of energy. Like, I mean, I know some of you do too. We have a lot of energy. We got to get the energy out. So the movement is sometimes just the energy that you get out, and then you could sit down and breathe, and then come to meditation. And I, I think of um, meditation is similar similar to praying. Only when I learned about praying, I think I learned about sending my words up. But now when I think of praying, I think more about the heart is open, and now maybe I can hear, maybe mm -hmm. I can hear God speaking to me. So that's it's changed a little bit different, you know. So um, somebody, somebody, yeah. After what you just said, I'm not sure what I'm going to say. It's really relevant, but um, there is a certain passivity in the way we Christians typically worship, and you know, Catholics at least go down on the kneeler, right? And um, so. Incorporating a uh, movement into worship has that uh, become. Is there any uh, research on that or? Um, Good question. What is private? Have you been to a black church? Exactly. Have you guys been to exactly. a black church? <laughs> okay. There is something going on there. You can't go there and not feel the spirit. The music and the movement and the amen, you know, all of that, there is something really special. So um, I I think we should be open to that. And um, even when I'm in church, I think, well, how can I incorporate movement when um, Pastor Jeffrey is speaking, for instance? I'm probably not going to, you know, that would maybe be a little bit too much, but I can bring my feet. <laughs> I can bring both feet on the ground and feel grounded. 
So I'm fully present. I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can sit up straight, rather. So I can sit up straight, so I'm I'm breathing better, and um, I may be more alert. And sometimes even, if I'm really brave, I might just bring my hands facing up. And that, just that simple mudra or that movement. Acceptance. Acceptance and willingness to hear. So those are the things that I, I do. Please. Nancy, you talked about being active. The Western Church I grew up in, active was stinging like crazy. <clears throat> Lutherans sting. And we sing for parks in the congregation. Who needed a choir? The old bachelor's choir. <laughs> and we had a very good choir. Right. But um, Ruth and Satan. Mm -hmm. It's vibration. Oh, yeah. gosh. It's vibration. It's and active. That is powerful. And mm -hmm. that's what Laura Jane, she she talks about more and understands more. And I feel like I'm, I'm just starting to learn that. Yeah. I'm sure other congregations do. But that was my inheritance. And then when I was in... <clears throat> When I was in grad school, I was a member of Vernon Detar's um, choir. He taught uh, organ at the Juilliard. And this choir is all professional. The um, Episcopal Church down in, um, in Manhattan. And talk about singing. That congregation could sing. And we had the, the two-part choirs encouraging him to do so. So I've never really belonged in a church that didn't sing heartily. Mm -hmm. So it surprises me when people sit there some hear and don't sing. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's how I grew up too. To me. I grew up too that um, only the ones who knew how to sing probably should sing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I totally can understand that. And now um, it, there is something special about the vibrational mm -hmm. singing together or praising together or yoga, we own, you know, that together. Or when there's a, 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 a chant, some of the chants that we do together, it, it definitely connects you more, brings you into the spirit. And I'm so glad that you are familiar with that. It's powerful. Singing is powerful. Chanting is powerful, and getting your body involved is, is to me, it's part of the spirit. I, I see it, like I said, I feel like um, yoga has just filled in the cracks for me for my own faith. I feel like I am a, I am um, a more, I'm a deeper Christian because of the yoga that I've learned. It's helped me to be more open to the spirit. Yes, and we're open to the vibration. Uh, I have heard people thinking about singing as those who are sort of hesitant. That if you're singing that loud, you're showing off. That's how I learned it. Right, you shouldn't sing too loudly. Mm -hmm. But even if you, <laughs> yeah, don't forget the exactly. That's that I, the negative part of my I life. I grew up on a farm, and that's exactly <laughs> kind of how where I was. Where about in family? Iowa? Um, Dad so I mean, on the farm in Minnesota. Yeah, same. Very similar. Culture. Dad somehow never grew up in church. What What Lucy was saying reminded me that when I was in second grade in Sunday school here, um, we really didn't have any prayers or anything in my family, but somehow they, they took me over here to the meeting house and called me in kindergarten Sunday school. Well, when I was in second grade, our Sunday school classes always did a hymn of some kind, some place. And I was sitting in your sermon, and this little red-headed girl next to me leaned over and said, you sing too loud. <laughs> 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 Oh, Betty was the soloist in our church for decades. Oh, I've heard her. Yes, so, absolutely. Yes, you, know, good to know. Yeah. you don't know that I sent my way to Medicare because when you're teaching, you don't pay the Social Security, you pay into the Illinois whatever retired teachers fund. 
And so when you retire, you can't get Medicare unless you put in 40 quarters of non-teaching, doing something and getting paid and having it put into Medicare. And when I started singing here as a paid soloist, it was $7.50 a service. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and as that proceeded or got larger over the years, um, even when it was, you know, $15 for two services, they always paid into Social Security. So I didn't have to do my 40 quarters. I already did. Oh, that's wonderful. I love wow. that. From your love, the abundance came. <laughs> I love that. You were so, living I mean, from your heart. Yes. And the yes. abundance was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. That's a great story. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You sing too. <laughs> I'm wondering in what ways um, a small cadre of people who practice yoga might transform a congregation. And have you seen any of that? In the, you said you <clears throat> are, are most of the members of your class in your congregation as well? They well, used to be um, before COVID. They were all members of the church. Okay. And um, some of them had autoimmune issues. And so we started practicing outside. And eventually people, it changed. And now I simply have mostly neighbors. I think there's one member of the church. But you know what? One person can change everything. As you know, that's one person in the congregation by turning to someone and saying, how are you today? Wonderful well, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, one person who feels more open and feels more loving and kind can change my name is Mark. Nice to meet you. And, um, you know, one person can change anything. So I feel like yoga has helped me just to be open. So good question. I think yoga can, it certainly changed me. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for Laura Jane, who has, you know, brought me a lot of things to think about. And it's been a long time just simmering and I've been musing on these things and and finally I'm like, you know what, I I can see how it, it helps my my faith rather than competes. I used to be worried that it's competing. And um now I realize it it's it's all part of my faith. Compatible. Compatible, thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's like um I thought it would just be a program that I ran, but it's really the hard drive. That um, yoga is the hard drive. It's um, um and the heart drive. And the heart drive. Yeah, it's our bodies. Our bodies are who we are. Our breath is who we are. These are things that are who we are. And um, not that I'm identified by, you know, what I look like or anything like that. But it is who I am. And um, living comfortably in that and bringing life to your body or your breathing or your mind, that helps me to live more faithfully as a Christian. I don't know a lot about yoga. Are there, are there different types of yoga, like the Eastern version, the Western, I mean, or is this yoga? It's... Um, it, it, it there's many many branches. I've seen a picture of the of a tree that had all the branches. So yeah, some of the branches go more into movement exercise, and some there's um, uh, branches of yoga that are all in service and doing good things. Um, karmic, I think. Or, um, yes, there's as many branches of yoga as there are Christianity. I I, I practice probably hatha. Um, she, Laura Jane talked about Hatha being the, the moon and the sun and balance. And so I'm staying um, with this particular part of the yoga because it's, you know, the moon and the sun, everything is balanced. I would do a different practice than somebody who's in their 90s. I would do a different practice than somebody's younger. Or, um, you know, if someone had more anxiety, I mean, you, you listen to what is right for you. So I appreciate all the different kinds of yoga, but I'm, you know, most of all, I listen to 
what's right? You know, good question. And then that goes, there's many different, many different answers for that. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts? I, I had one. Uh, <clears throat> I recently had some neck issues with regard to nerves and have been recommended to go to physical therapy, which appears to be the, the Medicare version of yoga. <laughs> 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 which is kind of an interesting thing because I was told, well, I can't really tell you very much except you need to figure out what hurts and what doesn't hurt and then avoid what hurts. And so what was interesting to me about your presentation was it's, it seems to me that science is is recognizing the importance of physical movement and physical well-being in terms of being therapeutic, in terms of treating ailments. I mean, and we have nerve issues. Part of part of the the, the the challenge is trying to sort out the signal from the noise and and to pay attention to your body and sort out what is from your nerve issue, what is just from the fact that you've got all these other muscles that are sending signals to your brain that you need to <laughs> sort out. So I really did appreciate your your presentation today because it, it reminded me of the fact that you know science is, I think, recognizing the importance of of mindful uh, body movement that can sort out these particular medical issues. I mean, we all have issues of some kind, you know, especially in your back, especially, especially in your back. Yeah, your back, back, your neck, or whatnot. You have to be really careful. You know, the older you get, the, the more more challenged you are with regard to the ease with which you can hurt yourself. And anyway, so I think yoga is a really great idea in the certainly a, a wonderful supplement to our understanding on how to be more mindful of our life. I could never have said it as well as you did. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> you're being very kind. <laughs> no, that, was, that was beautiful. And um, just being one with our, and, and also you can take that to your emotions too, you know. Maybe I do need to pay attention to a bad feeling. I remember having my daughter was going out with a friend of hers and I had a really bad feeling and I kept wanting to say, oh, I don't want, you can't go out tonight, I, you know. And um, it's just this feeling that, oh, I just don't want her going out tonight. I want her to be home. And certainly she did get into an accident. Nobody was hurt. It was a stupid accident. You know, what, you know, something that teenagers do with their cars that, you know, mindless and, um, and I, re I remember thinking, ah, oh, I should have listened. I need to listen to those little, you know, those emotional things as well, or something that's bothering me. Maybe I do need to just be open to healing in this area. So I would say if you have a really bad feeling about I do something about it. My sister's memory, of, and this was at Mad Park High School, the girl was dating someone, and it was a pretty serious dating, and he was away, and a friend of hers prevailed upon her to go out on, as it were, a blind date with this other person. And she was going steady with this other guy. And so she was feeling really wrong, but, um, and the person who named her to do this was Jane of somebody. And she said, okay, just to help you out. And there was an automobile accident, and she would have killed this girl who went along to help her friend out. Can you imagine how the boyfriend felt betrayed, for one thing, and then the whole relationship? And of course, Jane, who managed her to do this, her life was, shall we say, never the same. So, Watch out for bad feelings. There's something going on. There's something going on. Absolutely. Yeah, we have to listen to those. Mm -hmm. You know, and also the same thing is true when we have, I need to talk to that person, or, you know, maybe I, I remember I, this, I'm sure it doesn't happen to everybody. I'm thinking about your lunch. Gut instinct. Yes, yeah. instinct. That's gut instinct. Yeah. Gut instinct. And I've called people and they've said, I was just thinking about you. Just kind of irrationally, mm -hmm. like, what is that? Hey. And then later, oh, wow. You're more psychic than we We are. It's <laughs> energy. It, it, is, it happens like way too much to know that, to think that it's. Small world, we call it, or coincidence. 
Right. I can make a list, you know? Right. I think we can all think of those times when we just had this feeling and we followed through it and we're like, wow, that was that was funny. And I think that um I think for me yoga has helped me to just to listen more. It's just listening and uh, being away. Gut instinct. I think those things are all I think they're all in the Bible. Like I, I always, I mean, I can't help my Baptist background. I like the Bible to substantiate everything, and I know it can. I really, I don't believe it is, you know, this is the way it happened. I believe that it does have truth, and I come back to it, and I'm like, I look through it, and I'm like, I guess it, it's in there. It's in there. They did, you know, they had dreams, and Joseph had dreams, and I'm like, it's okay. I, it happened in the Old Testament, and it, that's all it was. Those, they listened to their instincts. They listened to their dreams. Well, it's the old three Romans. <clears throat> the summary of that famous chapter, the greatest of these, yeah. In the end, there are these three, oh. faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. King James had charity. Mm-hmm. Nothing is colder than we learn down the line. The greatest of these is love. I thank you. The basic. Thank you. Thank you. That's. I agree. It all comes back to love. So um, we'll end as we do in yoga. Okay. So bring your hands open. And just um, yeah, breathe. And notice everyone that's here. Now bring your hands together, palms together, and bring your thumb to your heart, the back of your thumb, press it towards your sternum. And the word in yoga is namaste, but it means, may the light that lives in me honor and love the light in you. Namaste. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank